Welcome to The Grass is Green. Um, this channel is about talking to some interesting people, getting to know their world a bit, and uh, uh, this series that we're working on today is part of a, um, a group of conversations I think of as the education of a forager. Um, I'm talking to some of my favorite plant people, asking how um, they just got started um, foraging for edible and medicinal plants. Um, so my name is Eric Fabian, and I'd like to welcome today um, Steve Brill, uh, better known as Wild Man Steve Brill, and his daughter Violet. Um, for any of you who are interested in foraging and don't know about Steve, uh, he is a naturalist and educator uh, and uh, a prolific author. He's written uh, multiple books about edible and medicinal plants. Uh, he's the maker of one of the most robust, probably the ro most robust um, foraging apps that's available for um, iPhone and, and Android um, that's out there today. I think it's called Wild Edibles. Um, Wild Edibles Forage. Wild Edibles Forage. And uh, he's also... I should mention, for those of you who don't live in kind of New York area, Steve is one of those kind of guys who's been doing his thing uh, for long enough now that he's kind of taken on kind of a legendary status in in the city. Uh, he uh, is uh, someone famous for having been arrested 31 years ago for uh, foraging for dandelions in Central Park, where you know he's handcuffed and um, and uh, and so on. And he is. Uh, I would say the person, anybody who gets started in foraging in the five boroughs in New York probably starts with one of Steve's classes. Um, we're also joined today by Steve's daughter, Violet. Um, Violet is, you know, I guess is as close as I've met to a foraging phenomenon. Uh, she, you know, she started foraging at two months old. Um, by age nine, was co-leading uh, tours with Steve. And now at 13, um, is probably teaching her old man a thing or two. So welcome to both of you. I'm excited to talk about... Um, how you guys came to the world of foraging. Um, just to get started, um, Violet, obviously you started so young, you know, it's hard to remember all the early days of stuff, but what do you think has changed in your approach to um, foraging since you were really little till today? Well, um, when I was really little, um, I would like to help teach people um, about like the plants and forage. And, um, and then when I get older, um, I like I'm helping to collect the plants. Um, when I'm little, I'm still showing people the plants and going around, but they're mostly just a lot of plants that I know. And but now, I mean, people um, like you, like I have interviews with people about how I know all the plants. Um, I get publicity for it, and I get I get paid sometimes for it. I get some money for it, um, and I know more plants now than I did before. Right, so you're on this path to becoming the professional forager, uh, walking in your father's footsteps. Steve, why do you think um, it's important for kids to learn to forage? It's part of environmental education. It's essential for all kids to be educated about the environment they live in. I, I teach edible plants. Violet also teaches them the birds. We had a birthday party two days ago with uh, six, seven, and eight-year-old kids. And uh, after close to two hours, it looks like we looked like we were getting to the edge, to the end of their attention span. They loved the plants. I told them all kinds of stories, myths, folklore, my own anecdotes. And just at the end, Violet spotted in a tree. A yellow warbler. So, um, yeah, it's like a warbler season right now. And I just happened to spot one. And all the kids, um, like, they were, like, looking around. It was like... <laughs> Like what? Yeah, it was like another 10 minutes that was circling. I see it. I see it. There it is. No, it hopped over there. Do you see it? No, I don't. Oh, now I see it too. And it just went on for another 10 minutes. So uh, the more earth literacy we have, and foraging is an incredible gateway into that because the, the foods taste delicious. They also happen to be extremely healthful, and they are renewable. Um the um, more kids get into this, the more they become aware of the natural environment around them. And of course, they become more interested in protecting it much better than walking them in straight lines um, into the park and back out. And nature isn't for you. It's boring. And uh, forget it. Uh, I've seen too much hands off nature turning kids off. 
and the hands-on stuff with things that get mowed down and just come right back up again, the better. Do you notice having, um, I think, learned foraging to this degree later in your life, Steve, a difference between how you understand or approach the natural world and, and the act of foraging than your daughter who's, who's really done it her whole life? Um, yeah, I mean, I learned it the hard way. I went out into the parks with books written by botanists who wouldn't know what a kitchen was if it fell on out, it fell on their heads. And I'm very into gourmet, nutritional, vegan cooking. So the cooking information was bad. And some of the information was just, uh, just wrong. And there's a plant called the water lily. And somewhere in the literature about Native Americans, oh, they ate the unrolling leaves in the ponds. Well, none of these botanists went out in ice water in April, uh, back before global warming when it was really cold in April. And I did that and I got the unrolling water lily leaves and washed them off thoroughly and taste them raw, steamed, sauteed, everything I could try with them. They always tasted exactly like the mud they grew in. Uh, obviously, these botanists had not gone and waited in for the ice water. So there's a lot of totally wrong information. And if you don't know anything about cooking and you happen to be dealing with food, you're going to have lots of, uh, lots of mistakes as well. And there's a plant called skunk cabbage. It smells like a skunk. And uh, it has calcium oxalate crystals, which sting your tongue. And, uh, the book I was using, the Peterson Field Guide to Edible Wild Plants, says that if you dehydrate the leaves, they uh, will not sting your tongue. And I put my dehydrator on high power and dehydrated the young unruly leaves for a week. Then I made a pot of chili. I took one bite of the chili. Ah! Oh, oh, ah, oh, oh, water! Ah! <clears throat> uh, finally dumped the whole pot of chili into the toilet and flushed. And uh, I never trusted that book again. Uh, so I, I, I experimented in the kitchen with everything and checked all the literature. And since the internet, I've also been um, uh, researching everything everyone else has done. And there's still new things to learn. We did a tour in Prospect Park in Brooklyn two days ago. And what did we find that we'd never eaten before, neither of us? Um, we found these, um, so there's paper mulberries. And paper mulberries um, have, well, they well, we never expected them to, but they had these fruits. They are like little brown balls, but they had like red kind of spikes out coming out of every direction. And there, but it's like a fruity kind of thing, and it's really sweet. And I never um, thought they would taste like that. Yeah, I've read about them for years, and I go to Prospect Park every few weeks for over 35 years, and they never ever had fruit on them. And this year they did. And one of the other one of the other uh, people on the tour, a uh, chef who'd done some foraging on his own, uh, didn't know that many of the plants that we showed him, but had found that uh, on a street in Brooklyn and had identified it. And uh, look up there, paper mulberries. Wow. That tree all the time. First time it produced fruit. Well, it seems like there's always a little bit of luck involved with all this stuff. Um, yeah. And uh, well, Violet, let me ask you a question. The, so now you've been teaching uh, alongside your dad for, for several years now. And um, when people come out on a tour, um, what's the first thing that you'd like to teach to a new forager? Is it a certain kind of plant or is it a certain kind of idea about foraging? Or like, what do you, how do you like to start people off? Um, I mean, sometimes like um, if they're a beginner forager and they don't know any plants, I'd like wood sorrel. There's a plant called yellow wood sorrel. It looks like a clover, except the clover has oval-shaped leaves. Wood sorrel has heart-shaped leaves. So there's three heart-shaped leaves, and sometimes you'll see this um, pretty small yellow flower. Um, it only has five petals, and you'll see this little um, fruit. It's like this little long green seed pod, and it tastes like lemonade. 
It's a really good plant. It's an easy one to recognize. You don't eat the roots or the stems because the stem is too tough. You just don't eat the root. But the leaves, the flowers, the fruits you can eat, and they're all really good. They taste like lemonade. It's an easy to recognize plant. People can remember it easily. And if you're just walking down the street, you can see it, you can pick it, you can eat it, and or put it in a salad or whatever you want to do. And yeah. it's good. And it grows back again. Yeah. It, you know, it's, it's funny. Uh, wood sorrel was one of those ones when I started. Actually, I had a hard time latching onto because it looks similar to a clover and at that point it was just like my eyes couldn't make all the small disti distinguishing I mean, like, things. If you see it when it's really small like that, like normally I wouldn't want to give it to like someone if it's like really small, little small leaves, no flower, no fruit or anything like that and it's, and it's growing right in a field with clovers and grass, that's not really good but I mean like people like a lot of times on the like on the tours especially tours with kids we find wood sorrel it's big it's abundant it's all growing there it's pretty tall with big heart-shaped leaves they're about this big and um and like big flowers big fruits and they'll see it and they'll recognize it and then throughout the entire tour they'll say look it's the lemon it's the lemon plant it's lemongrass sometimes they'll even say like they'll say oh i know this plant we'd say it's the lemon one we always eat it Right, right, right. Yeah, and yeah. It's, that's it's an easy one. It's an easy one for me because the clover has heart shaped leaves, so it reminds me of violet, who I love. Wood sorrel <laughs> has oval leaves, no heart, so it reminds me of my ex girlfriend who ran off with another guy on Valentine's Day twenty two years ago, who also has no heart. <laughs> well, when, when we went, oh, one, one very important key for beginners uh, is. Uh, if there are two plants that look superficially similar, like the clover and the wood sorrel, you hold them both up in front of the person's eyes at the same time. The brain automatically then makes the distinction and you never confuse them again. Right. It's like an automatic process with the, with the brain. That's interesting. Um, you also, I know Steve, you, you really focus on stories and uh, using storytelling to teach, but then also... Um, you know, think about uh, storytelling as really um, tied to uh, plants in general and kind of learning the full scope of it. Could you talk about like storytelling and, and, and the, the role of storytelling um, in learning and in and, and, and experiencing foraging? Well, there's a problem in general with science that the general public just doesn't get it. And if their ideology uh, gives false info about science, they're going to uh, believe it and just make excuses or cherry pick so that the uh, so that what their ideology tells them uh, is is true. And an important part of um, science education that a lot of scientists now that are dealing with the public and are sort of uh, upset about what's going on with science denial are saying is that you can't just use raw data. We have photographs in the 19th century, they had beautiful paintings, which people uh, who appreciated art absolutely loved. And that made the science more real and more meaningful, especially botany, which was a popular science that people without a telescope or microscope could do. And science educators are now bringing back the illustrations with the photos, and I do that on my app. I do paintings and uh, drawings of plants in different stages. So that is very important. And then all of the non-technological cultures that had a huge amount of information that people needed to learn. If you were an apprentice shaman, uh, you did not want to poison the chief's uh, wife. Maybe his mother-in-law would be all right, but not, uh, right. not his wife or his kids, and there was no writing. So you had to memorize absolutely everything. And in the slow seasons, North America would be the winter, you would learn the stories that had both the data about the plants and the, um, the fiction, the oral traditions. You'd have to learn that word for word so that in five generations hence, a plant that may not have been seen for a hundred years uh, would not suddenly change from being poisonous to edible. And that really gives your brain a handle on learning. It's one of the objections I have with, with the way schools teach. It uh, turns you off, you're trying to stay awake. 
and you have to memorize the data. And once the test is over, you forget it all. The stories of folklore and the mythology are tried and true methods for educating people even before there was any literature. And I also try to have people interact. I'm going back to Socrates, I ask questions. Uh, this plant has estrogen in it. Why does a plant with no ovaries have estrogen? And people think for a minute. And then I say, well, uh, besides human beings, who are the biggest enemies of plants? And very often someone will come up with the right answer, insects. And uh, then I'll ask, well, what system in an insect's body would, would estrogen interfere with? And that, of course, is reproduction. In science, you have a hypothesis. You have to test it. Uh, how do you test it? You give two groups of insects the same standard laboratory insect chow, and one group gets the estrogen sprinkled in, and then you test them. How big is this one? How much does it weigh? Um, how fast did it uh, take to pupate? And the bottom line in each group is how many grandchildren did each group produce? So which group do you think will be better at producing grandchildren, the estrogen group or the control group? I would imagine the control group in this case. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the control group does better. And in a natural setting, the control group would outcompete any group of insects dumb enough to eat the plant with estrogens, and uh, the experimental group would just vanish. And then the question is, what does estrogen, uh, how does estrogen interfere with uh, human disease? Which human disease is characterized by undue growth? Uh, well, there's th on, thyroid issues I know about, like on cellular level. Yeah, I uh, I don't know. Dwarfism. What disease has cells uh, reproducing? Ah, uh, well, just uh, cancer. <laughs> yeah, cancer. And these plants uh, interfere with cancer cell reproduction. Huh. If you eat plants that have these plant estrogens, an ad adaptation for benefiting uh, benefiting the plant and reducing insect predation, you wind up with a lower risk of cancer. Hmm. So all these interesting mechanisms, and again, I try to ask uh, questions and have people interact um, with those, those uh, berries that Violet found. We had a dad put his, what was it, uh, six-year-old, eight-year-old kid eight. on, on his shoulders, and she managed to grab the branches with great difficulty and finally got some that I was able to pull the branches down, everyone got the food. So the, uh, the interaction is wonderful too, which you don't always get in a classroom setting. Yeah. Well, Violet, do you, do you find that your friends are interested in foraging? Like, do you, do you talk about it? Do they come over to your house and have like wild food dinners and stuff? With you? Um, well, if my friends are, um, de um, some of them are definitely like interested. Like a lot of them are also like interested that I'm interested in it. And like, um, yeah, sometimes like my friend Caitlin, she comes on a lot of our tours. Um, a lot of the time she bring like bags and collect the plants. Um, and if I'm outside playing with my friends, I'll show them a plant here and there. And, um, and yeah, and, yeah, they, they seem pretty interested in it. I mean, they're definitely sometimes, like, interested in, like, the birds and especially my parakeet wisteria. Um, yeah, and we feed him wild greens, and they come over, and they feed him wild greens, and then they're interested in both the bird and the plant. Huh. Yeah, unfortunately, they have so little some in mind. Of some of them. Some of them have had zero exposure That's not true. to you no? know. They're afraid of your bird. They're afraid of the blind bird. But they don't but they think like they like finding feathers outside and stuff. Like they they are afraid of the bird, but that's an exception. Well, it's definitely, you know, having lived in both this a large city and, and more of country environments, um, you know, people who grow up with nature more or less do, you know, just have a different sense of safety and stuff around that. So I can I can totally understand, um, depending on where you are, people have very different kind of feelings of uh, about nature and just familiarity with it. Um, 
Uh, Steve, you mentioned uh, the interaction and, you know, obviously you uh, experience foraging in big groups sometimes. I, I know you've gone out and you've even had groups come out that are like 100 people and just like huge kind of moving through a park um, and, and maybe more typically like, you know, 10 or 20 um, coming out with you on a tour. Um, is foraging fundamentally a social activity? Um, cause I know a lot of people really protect their, their territories, you know, the right, right time to pick that, that favorite mushroom or whatever. Uh, yeah, I find it, I find it social. I don't agree with people being territorial. I like the uh, concept of sharing things. I and mean, in, an, yeah. in an update of my, in an update of my app, eventually I'll have social networking where people can, uh, put locations of common plants that they found and share that with others and evaluation. So if a troll uh, says there's going to be delicious June berries in this location, you go there and all there is is poison ivy, they wind up getting one star. I mean, yeah, foraging, yeah, foraging, you, you could, it's most likely you'll do it like with a group of friends or like we do with groups of people. And it's a lot more fun that way also, but no one's saying that you can't just go outside and pick the plants. Like you can always go and do something like just like by yourself or one or two friends. But like it's most, it's more fun when you have a lot of people there to tell the stories with, to pick with, to go walk through the woods with. And I guess it always helps to have more eyes on the out, lo looking out yeah. for things as well, if right? You have, if you're looking for mushrooms, I mean, if you're looking for mushrooms, like, you have to spread out. Like, we tell everyone, whenever we see a bunch of mushrooms, spread out, look for mushrooms. Um, yeah, and, and then, like, if someone, if someone already looks behind this stub, why should another person go and look behind that stub, too? That is the whole point of spreading out. Yeah, plus if they get separated from the group, by then I already have their money. <laughs> <laughs> cha-ching right <laughs> um well uh violet do you have a a favorite plant to forage like is there something you really like look forward to when it comes around um i like a lot of the berries and nuts like the black walnuts are around this time um octo like october and september um yeah um i really like finding like a lot of the nuts and also um the berries like throughout like the like throughout the year um if we find a lot like raspberries um if we find raspberries or wine berries a type of wild raspberry or purple flowering raspberry it'll be really excited and i've been looking forward to that all year i didn't get that many if i didn't get that many the last year i'll be excited for finding those so i really like berries and um like nuts like that yeah, it's now late September, so we're looking forward to wild raisins, yeah. autumn olives, and, and persimmons, and apples and crab apples. I have a, I have bags of those in the refrigerator. Do you guys, uh, just based on your tours, uh, do you, you, you just collect enough from those outings to kind of keep you going, or do you do you do a lot? Um, do you spend a lot of time out there on your own outside the tours just to kind of keep the your the larder full? Well, I do a lot of outdoor exercise, bike riding and um, rapid walking, and I'm always finding stuff. I'm already doing too much cooking. Yeah, uh, yesterday, me and my friend Owl, we walked home from school together, and just on the way home, you're just walking, there's this plant called the Japanese yew. The berries are really good, and um, you'll see them, like, um, Around, you'll see them around it's a type of evergreen just of, um it's a bush you'll see these little red berries on it the berries are wonderful you have to spit out the seed because if you swallow the seed it'll stop your heart well not everyone not everyone no donald trump can eat them he has no heart <laughs> the uh well that's a <laughs> that's a uh a, a really uh maybe a a plant for a little bit more expert people with that very strong kind of like Taste delicious, <laughs> might I kill mean, you, it, kind of. But, but <laughs> I mean, you were eating it, them yeah. when you were three. I you know. Just spit out the seed, it's like a cherry. If you can eat a cherry and spit out the seed, you can eat a you. Yeah, well, yeah let's like, talk about we, that a little bit, because you know, obviously, you spit it. You eat too many cherries, you'll get sick and die. But the, but the, you know, people make mistakes, and like, how do you, when you're working with like a very young kid, how do you make sure that the mistakes don't happen? Um. Well, like, we, we tell them in, like, very clear and simple instructions. Like, for a little kid, like, 
here you go, this is a berry, you can eat it, but you spit out the seed, you tell them, like, um, like, what'll happen, like, you'll tell them, like, what to do, and you'll make sure they spit out the seed, or you can just take out the seed and give them the berry. Right. Yeah, or when I have tours with young kids, show me the plant before you uh, eat it, and then I have, uh, uh, like, yeah, 30 something... hands in my face, is this the one, is this the one, yeah, is but... this the one? Yeah, but with the berry, and then, with the berry, you can't really do that because because then um, because like you even if they have the right berry, you don't know if they're gonna spit out the seed. Yeah, but that's only yeah. one. That's only one berry, I and mean, we we shake mulberries off the branches of the trees onto a onto a drop cloth, and uh, once we we've moved the drop cloth around, gotten all the branches within reach, everyone comes in and scoops handfuls and puts them in their containers. Right, and right. There's no, there's no problem with that. And uh, the same thing with the raspberries, although they do have thorns, and I'll show the kids, don't uh, be careful, these thorns, ah, don't touch the sharp, ah, these are very, de ah, oh, never mind. So, so, Steve, how did you get started foraging? Uh, how did you come to it? Well, first I was hungry. Uh -huh. I was trying to become a chess master. Uh -huh. My best game, I beat a master in a tournament, and I was winning in, in 16 moves, but I did not play consistently at that level. So I happened to pass the kitchen, and there was a, a carton of oatmeal in the cabinet. And I looked, and there was a recipe. So I made the recipe, and it was quite delicious. Then I made the recipe on the side of the raisin box. This is before the Internet. Uh, eventually, I started going to the public library and got some cookbooks. I was learning about health and nutrition at that time, so I was trying to make things healthy and nutritious. And one day, at a period when I was exploring ethnic stores for exotic ingredients, I was bicycling for exercise, and there were these ethnic Greek women dressed in black in a local park picking something. I asked them what they were doing, but I couldn't understand a word. It was all Greek to me. But I, I came home with a bag of grape leaves. They were absolutely delicious. I stuffed them. And uh, then I started getting books on wild edible plants. And as I mentioned in the beginning, the information was not all accurate. But, and sometimes I'd have to wait a year before I could eat anything or even longer. And there was one, there's one fruit called the Cornelian cherry. It's a member of the dogwood family and it is very, very tasty, but it wasn't in any of the field guides. It turns out it's not an American plant. It was in a tree and shrub book, so I knew what it was and there are poisonous dogwoods. So I could not eat this. But I was doing a tour in Central Park, and there was a guy by the name of Bob. Now, you may know people like Bob. Whatever you tell him, he doesn't listen. Uh, please sign up ahead of time so I know how many people are coming. He shows up in the middle of the tour. He figures where I'm going to go. Um, so anything you tell him, he doesn't listen. Wild wow, man, this berry looks really good. Can I eat it? I said, sorry, Bob. It's a Cornelian cherry. It's in the dogwood family. I haven't found any information as to whether it's poisonous or not. There are poisonous dogwoods. Yeah, but what if I just eat one? What if one is the poisonous dose? As soon as my back is turned, Bob picks one from the bush and eats it. I see it out of the corner of my eye. I don't know whether to be happy that maybe I'll finally be rid of Bob. I don't want someone on my tour dying. Yeah, but if it's Bob, it'll actually be worth it. Well, Bob acted totally normal for Bob. Uh, he tried to make friends with a woman 30 years younger than him. Hey, you want to go on a walk with me after Wild Man's Walk? Why don't you come home with me? Uh, anyway, that woman called me up that evening. Wild Man, that old guy followed me home. I had to slam the door in his face to get rid of him. I'm never coming on another one of your tours again. And she Done. never did. So I knew Bob had not been affected by the berry. <laughs> well, and I, finally, I found out that it's the national fruit of Turkey. And they're then actually I, edible. Uh, yeah, I took some home and tried some, and they were terrible. And I didn't know what to do. I just let them sit there on the, on the table. And they went from bright red 
off the bush, the only berry that does this in our part of the world, to dark purple, and they got soft, and then they became really delicious. They taste like, uh, a little bit like plums. Intense flavor, you don't need a lot in a recipe, and it adds a sourness and wonderful taste to anything you put it in, but that's not the end. I did a TV show, a cable show, when cable was new in the, uh, in the early 90s, and I didn't have a car back then. The cable TV people sent a cab to drive me to the studio and drive me back. I was talking to the cabbie on the way back, and he said he was Turkish. And I said, oh, I know a, a Turkish food. And when there was a red light, I opened my book that had just come out, and I showed him the Cornelian cherry. And he said, oh, we know this one in Turkey. In ancient times, they took the long, slender, straight twigs of the Cornelian cherry, and they would give one to one boy and another to another boy. And what would the two boys do when they had these long, straight twigs? What do you think they, they would start do? Fight. <laughs> Probably they start fighting. Start <laughs> dueling with it. Yeah. And it turns out that all the Bronze Age warriors that you read about in, in Homer and uh, all of the other, all of the other uh, mythology and warrior uh, stories, they all learn their sword craft from the twigs of the Cornelian, uh, the, the long thin branches of the Cornelian cherry. Huh. So there's always new things to learn. So that's how my knowledge of that particular species developed. And of course I tell right. that story. And once I was telling the story and I had just finished talking about Bob, when Bob walks into the tour, and I say, hi, Bob, and everyone is laughing their heads off. <laughs> well, at least uh, you, you can, he keeps coming back, so you can keep trying new, uh, new things out on him. Um, I, I did want to ask no, you, no. I, have, I have a couple of your books. I have your, you have a wild vegan uh, cookbook uh, that is uh, one of the few really wild um, cookbooks, I think, out on the market. And then you have... Uh, a book that's been around for a while called, uh, you know, Identifying and Harvesting Edible and Wild Medicinal Plants. Yeah, that was the uh, one I showed to the so Tur Turkish plants. cab driver. So you mentioned medicinal plants in this in this book. Um, how did 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 medicinal plants? Was that something that kind of came along later on, or like how did no, you? No, I was I was interested in that all along. My my concept is prevent illness. Mm -hmm. um, I'm I'm 68 years old. I'm a vegan. I do uh, about 70 minutes of hatha yoga three out of four days. I do two 20 minute rounds of transcendental meditation every day, uh, and the yoga I do with light weights. I do uh, three out of four days, a mile of uh, lap swim, and that uh, alternating with an hour of rapid walking, and then another mile in the pool, one day off, or a mile in the pool, one day of uh, hour-long bike riding, and one day off. And all of that together uh, has kept me fit and healthy. I really like prevention. I'm 68. I do a mile in the pool in 43 minutes. I've so far outlived uh, five out of six family members from my parents and grandparents' generation who were not healthy before they passed on. And there's plenty of science supporting this kind of lifestyle as opposed to the white flour, sugar, and meat diet that big food is pushing down our throats, which is also bad for the environment. Uh, so I have medicinal plants, but I eat them. And here, here's one called rockweed. And this is a hard one for me to use because I'm a jazz fan, and it's a seaweed. Yeah, you'll see it on rocks. Um, it grows. Um, you'll see it on the rocks. It's really, it's really good. Um, it'll cover the rocks in big mats. Um, By the seashore. Yeah, of course, on the seashore. It's a seaweed. Yeah, you could eat it raw. You can cook it. It's really good. And this was the herbal remedy for thyroid problems. If the thyroid problems were caused by iron deficiency, you would be cured because it is loaded, I'm sorry, iodine deficiency. It is loaded with iodine. It's also loaded with all kinds of other minerals. And uh, I'm, I've discovered ways of preparing it. Of course, things where seaweed is traditionally used like miso soup, it's great. 
but I'll mix one part of white miso in a food processor with half a part sesame oil and a quarter part pine nuts and then put other flavorings in there, sweet or savory. For the rockweed, I put in melted baker's chocolate, a few dates, and wild coffee from Central Park from the Kentucky coffee tree, a uh, couple of other uh, oh, seasonings, and it is uh, absolutely delicious, chocolate-covered seaweed. No one does anything like that. And if I mix it with cashews, raisins, carob chips, and a dash of stevia, you get a really, really good trail mix. I think Violet is looking for that in the refrigerator. No, uh, it's, no? it's up here. Oh, she found something. Oh, she found the coffee. It comes in these big pots hanging on the trees. Mm -hmm. You could either find the whole pot or inside there are individual seeds. Um, I'll get the seeds. Yeah. So yeah, you, we what we do, yeah, we use this with the chocolate. We make the truffles. We we make hot chocolate also. Um, Violet, out of, do, do you yeah. share your father's interest in cooking at this point? Do you like to cook with the stuff you find? Yeah, I do. I do. Um, yeah, we make the truffles together all the time. He also makes curried sunflower seeds that I make that I help to make. These are the coffee seeds. Mm, yeah. And I remember, I think I, was, I think I was actually on one of your tours. We collected some of those, and they have kind of a goopy, a goopy substance. I always love to cook. If we're making something, even if it's me and my mom are making something that um, wouldn't normally involve wild plants, we put in wild plants. Right. Yeah, I remember when she was quite young, um, uh, people were whispering to each other, follow that kid, she finds all the oh, coffee I remember seeds. That. <laughs> yep coffee seeds and no one could find any but I was a little finding them every step I took so I kept picking them up picking them up and I heard people whispering find her follow her she finds all the seeds right 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 um Steve was your were your parents it, it, they a lot of people pick up stuff from their parents like even if it's uh, simple uh going to get apples or berries or something did your did your parents have any interest in kind of foraging or cooking or any of the stuff that you captured your imagination well, they were from Europe, where foraging has always been a thing, more or less. And my mom did show me raspberries, blackberries, and strawberries when we went on vacation in the country. I did not know that they were growing around here. And, of course, I still pick them, except for the blackberries. They become very rare. You know why? Why? Too, too much competition from the iPhone. <laughs> It's interesting uh, learning about this kind of stuff in the city because um, even though nature, you know, you think of the concrete jungle and nature being at a distance, the diversity of ecosystems here is, is quite amazing. And I feel like you get to encounter a lot of different stuff in the different parks. And then obviously the seashore is here, you know, kind of nearby. And um, you have uh, a lot of ornamental stuff and a lot of decorative things that come into the streets that... Um, bring in things that might not naturally uh, have, a, a, you know, kind of occurred in this part of the world. Um, so and there's, and there's something important that's missing in the city that you get in the country that's very important. I don't know if we can say four-letter words on this show, but it starts with a D, it ends with an R, and the two middle letters are both E. <laughs> right, the deer. They, go, they, they are aggressive in this part of the world as well. Yeah. yeah they're wary with... When you're foraging, it's way better when there's no deer. Yeah, that's interesting. You'll think the woods, like if you have, we have like local nature um, near us, and you'll think the woods is so great, like where better to go for nature than the woods. But the deer are like in our, like in, especially like Mamaroneck and large spot, like there's a humongous population of deer. And people were trying to do something and get rid of them. But, um, but yeah, they're in when you go out into the city parks, there's so many more plants. We do the four-hour tours, but we can literally, in Prospect Park, where we start, like, where we start behind this gazebo, like, area where this path goes up, there's, like, we there's enough plants right there to do the whole four-hour tour. Yeah, there's poor man's pepper, there's burdock, there's black nightshade, um, there's lamb's quarters, there's amaranth. There's um, hedge, hedge mustard. There's, there's, hedge a, mustard. there's a juneberry tree up there, too. I there's yeah, there's a juneberry right bush. There. Yes, yeah. yes. And, and if we did everything there, we'd be there for well over an hour. Huh. 
Um, Violet, uh, now having having grown up with this, and you know, um, uh, you know, knowing a lot of stuff really kind of deeply in your bones, who inspires you today? Like w when you're trying to learn more about the natural world. Oh, that's what I'm trying to learn more. Like just about the plants or like nature in general, because. For plants, it was obviously my like dad, but like I have like, there's this great, like this author, Claire Walker Leslie, I don't know if you've heard of her or not, but she does these nature books and they're so, they're so good. It's like how like to like observe the outside world and nature, like draw sketches of insects and like keep a log of what you see and stuff. She does like these so calm, like great books with information, cool facts, like, um, like why is the sky blue or something like that like pages with like these cool facts like phases of the moons what the clouds are all called and stuff like that and um and yeah she i really like her books and i'll learn a lot from her books but in terms of plants you, you have the expert <laughs> at home <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll mock what people in other foraging books do that like is wrong we'll like sit there and we'll just point out every single wrong thing that they say uh, there's one there's one app the one, one book that came out that says you could eat uh you could make tea with the leaves of all evergreens oh that and the author you. was me meant <laughs> meant or had read somewhere pines and he said evergreens and that of course would include the you which right. we uh discussed earlier which is absolutely deadly yeah it's good to have, check multiple sources always uh when, when you're learning um the uh i uh well this has been really great i i think um it was really interesting to kind of hear um your guys stories and um if just if people are you know in the new york area and they want to take part in one of your tours or just learn more about what you guys do um what's a good way to get more information yeah, go to the tour calendar on my website, Wild Man Steve. Or just Grill. browse the website. You'll see, like, there we have um, identification for for some of the plants out there, like the most common ones that we see, and some mushrooms also. And, like, if you want to know about us, like, he has tabs on, like, his arrest, like, all this other, um, his arrest, like, of what he, we do and stuff like that. Yeah, so it's Wild Man Steve Grill, B R I L L dot com. And that has everything. And if you get my books, get signed copies from me. So um, Amazon doesn't get everything but a few pennies. And we sign the books. Um, and I'm not just in New York City. I do things in Connecticut. I'm on Island. You went to Massachusetts. And I'm going to be in uh, Philadelphia in a couple of weeks. I go there a few times a year. And we're available if people have contacts in the region with nature centers, land trusts, health food stores, farmers markets, teaching farms, uh, schools, day camps, any kind of organization where we can spread the word and get more people involved in nature, that would be great, especially kids. And there was a kid who's now 30 years old who got inspired uh, on one of my tours, his first introduction to nature when he was a school kid decades ago. And he is uh, successfully stopping the New York subway system from turning an old abandoned railroad uh, line that runs through Forest Park in Queens into a subway and is turning into a walkway. It's called the Queensway. I've gotten emails from people doing ecotourism around the world that started with me. So the more people we can reach, especially kids, not that I mind adults, and I like when people bring dogs. We love when people bring dogs on their tour. The more people that have uh, environmental awareness, the more force there will be to uh, protect the environment and uh, stop people being elected who are just going to destroy everything so we can get a few more uh, tons of coal out of the ground. I wonder who that could be. On that note, um, I I will put some links either kind of up in the air around our heads um, to kind of well, we have stuff. And we have some notes. <laughs> oh, yeah? Yeah, here are our notes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> all right. That's all, folks. That's all, folks. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, good to speaking with you. And uh, this was uh, The Grass is Green, and my name is Eric Fabian. So thank you to Steve Brill and Violet for, for talking with us today. It was a pleasure. It was great.